reading is Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 to 39. A disciple is not oh, sorry. <laughs> um, a disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not be known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted, so do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge... I don't know, is that me or... Yeah. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Do you see why I went, ooh, when I read that? Ooh. You can't understand this lesson without the one we read last week because this follows directly after it. One of your biggest Bible quiz du jour. Who can name all 12 disciples of Jesus? Let's try it together. Somebody call out a disciple's name. You don't know any of the disciples. Not a one. Simon Peter, Andrew, James, Thaddeus, John, Thaddeus, not Paul, Paul was later, but this is one of the original 12, Judas. he was an apostle, Judas, James. Bartholomew, James, John, the other Simon, Sleepy Dopey and Doc, but the problem is when you name them out of order, then I think, what would we miss? <laughs> Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Thomas, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector. That's those are two we missed. You got them. Good for you all. So he last week called him and he set them apart. And what were they thinking? We are going to kick Rome right out of this kingdom. We're going to reestablish the kingdom of God, the rightful people on the throne here in Israel like they belong. Jesus says, no, 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 no. Don't get yourselves so excited because it's going to be a tough road to hoe out there. And then he lists all these things that are going on. He says, if they're going to call me the devil, what are they going to say about you guys? And then he goes on to list all these things and ends up with, you know, take up your cross and follow me or you're not worthy of me. Let's go back and talk about Jeremiah for a moment first. What do you know about Jeremiah? Anybody know anything about Jeremiah? He was, what do you know? Paul got his hand up. What do you know about Jeremiah? He's your son. Okay. What do you know about Jeremiah Price? No, we're not going to go there. We all know a lot about Jeremiah Price. He's a great kid. Named for a great prophet. If you were named after the prophet, which I don't know if you were or not, but you all have some biblical names in your family. So I'm thinking maybe you were. But Jeremiah is always painted how? I've said this before. Why do they paint him? Nobody knows what he looked like. Nobody had a cell phone there to take his picture. But why, how is he always painted? He's painted as bald. Why is he painted as bald? He ripped his hair out. Because God's people frustrated him so much, he ripped his hair out. Never married. Never had children. Did not want to be a prophet. Was called when he was a teenager. Didn't want to be a prophet, and God made him a prophet, a mighty prophet, one of the major prophets in Israel, talking about the exile that was going to come and saying, God's going to let you reap what you sow, people. You've got to be careful. got to be careful. got to be careful. God finally says, I'm done with these people. I'm going to let them come in and take you out of your land. 
What does Jeremiah do then? He goes out and he buys an orchard in the middle of ground zero. If your neighbor's house burned down, would you go over and make an offer on it? Probably not. But that's what he does. He buys an orchard in the middle of a land that's about to be under siege. Why would you do something that crazy? You do that if you believed in God's word, that God was going to come and redeem the people, that God was going to bring you all back into your land at some point. It's a sign of hope, incredible hope, and trust in God. So hang on to that thought. And what is Matthew gospel saying what is jesus saying to them about hope here you think there's any hope in that passage just look at all the stuff that's going to happen jesus says it's not going to be an easy road how many of you ever found discipleship to be an easy road true discipleship is it always easy no it's not because you're going to have opposition you're going to have people who tell you you're out of your mind if you believe this nonsense i had a woman once at a funeral walk up to me and say god damn you I was shocked, and she said, how dare you lie to these people? There is no, there is no grace for this man who had died, someone who died by his own hand, and she said, how dare you say he was with God in heaven? People will be like that, won't they? Miss Linda Astle's here today. She told me about when she was living in a parsonage with her father, who was a pastor, looked out, she and her brother were home alone. You were 14 years old, Linda, wasn't she, when there was a cross burning on your front yard? because her father had talked about integration and people didn't like that. Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace. I can bring a sword that's going to separate family from family, mothers and daughters. Now, mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law, we can understand that a little bit, can't we? <laughs> but mothers and daughters are going to be at odds against each other because of Christ, because of his message taking precedence over everything else in their lives. And then what does Jesus say? Don't be afraid, though. I don't want you to be afraid. I've always said, whenever somebody in Scripture says to you, don't be afraid, be afraid, be really afraid, because God's going to ask you to do something crazy. Mary, don't be afraid. You're going to have a baby out of wedlock when the law says they should drag you out to the street and stone you to death. And Joseph, don't be afraid to marry this unwed mother, even though people are going to laugh at you the rest of your life and call you all kinds of stuff, and you know about her, don't you? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, shepherds, when the sky lights up and angels drop down and says, this Messiah has been born to you. My favorite of all is they go to the tomb ready to anoint his body for burial. What do they see angels saying? Don't be afraid. And they're pretty afraid. They run off and tell the men, and the men say, nope, 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 nope. Don't be afraid, Jesus says, because God knows how many hairs are on your head. Don't be afraid because God knows the sparrows of the sky. You know how big a sparrow is? A little tiny thing, isn't it? A little sparrow. Two sold for a penny when people couldn't afford a bigger offering to make. But God says not even one falls to the ground. Everyone is offered that God does not know by name and care for. So don't be afraid. God says you're worth more than many sparrows. So we're called to acknowledge God not to deny God, which is why that old hymn came to mind, you know, that we sang this morning. What was it? Jesus is all the world to me, and true to him I'll be. Oh, how could I this friend deny when he's so true to me? You can't deny Christ without Christ denying you, and that's a hard concept to hold on to. But here he is saying, can you turn it down a little bit? I'm getting a lot of Noise. We're, we're working on a new microphone and a new sound system, so we need your patience a little bit. Everybody hearing me okay? But you're hearing every time I exhale through my nose, too, I think. I sure am. Okay, where was I? Hmm. We can't deny Christ without Christ denying us. We had to pick up a cross and follow. And understand what a cross meant to these people was something horrible. It was Romans, the Roman way of getting rid of the worst of their enemies, the, the low lowlifes. And decent people, even decent Jewish people, didn't use the word cross. It was a dirty word. Now it is the sign by which we're saved. So if God can take the cross and turn it into something of power and beauty and redemption, don't be afraid. So where's the fire? I've told you before with Jeremiah, that 
When you go into the Methodist ministry, the United Methodist Church ministry, they ask you to tell your call story again and again and again. I've told it here many times. But you also have to pick a story in scripture that you identify with. Someone else's story of call. And my first understanding was Sarah. When she was told that 100 years old, she was going to be the mother of Isaac, what did she do? She laughed. God said to me, Terry, I want you to be a pastor. And Terry laughed because Terry said, oh, God, you appointed somebody else. I got in the way. But now I think it's Jeremiah because nobody likes to hear a bad sermon, right? Right? Nobody likes to give a bad sermon either, but we do sometimes. But nobody likes a sermon that steps on your toes, right? If I talk about racism, I see some of you just freeze up like she's calling me a racist. Nope, I'm saying help me fight racism. I'm not telling anybody you are a racist. But that's what people hear. People hear all sorts of things when I speak that I don't even say. But nobody likes the sermon that steps on their toes, do they? And sometimes people have said to me, how dare you talk about me and my situation up there? Those are the sermons that I'm preaching to myself usually. I don't know what people have individually going on in their lives unless they've come to me and shared. Sometimes people think I read their mind and know their sin. No, I don't have that power. Aren't you glad I don't have the power? I'm not omniscient. I don't know what you're all doing on your own. But I know what it is to be called to preach a word. Now, Albert Outler was the man who developed a disciple Bible study, and he had a very distinctive Southern accent. He came to Wesley Seminary and spoke to us once, and he was pre preaching on the prophet Jeremiah and about how we're called to have a prophetic word, even when people don't want to hear it, because nobody wanted to hear Jeremiah, did they? And Someone said, if I said that in my church, they'd throw hymnals at me. And he said, they got to remember that Jeremiah was not called to be the pastor of a United Methodist congregation. Because nobody likes those big old prophetic sermons that say you've got to be nice and you've got to be good and you've got to do this and that and the other, do you? You don't like those at all, especially if you're not doing those things. And Jeremiah just said, you know, I'm not going to preach anymore. I'm not going to do what God wants me to do. I'm just going to go in and say happy, happy thoughts. I'm going to go in and say, God loves you. Let's all go home. Let's go to Dairy Queen and have a Sunday and call it a day. But he couldn't do it. Why? Because he had a fire in his bones. He had to preach what God gave him. He had to speak out on God's behalf. So where's the fire? What does that expression mean when you say something? Where's the fire? It usually means you're going too fast. Slow down, doesn't it? So we're going to do the BBS lessons this year that we're going to do. We're going to do the fire stories in scripture. We're talking about hearts on fire. Toby has developed this beautiful logo for us, a flame with a dove in the middle, the Pentecost symbol. So where's the fire? Where's the fire, Epworth? Where are we going to go? Where are we going to take this word of God? Is it burning in our souls? Can we not contain it? We've got to be out in the world sharing Christ because too many people do not know the love of God and Jesus Christ. We're not going to know it if we keep our mouths shut. So where's the fire? Where are we headed next with this story? Because Jesus told us, don't be afraid. And because of him, we can't be afraid. And Jeremiah was not afraid. And Jeremiah spent the rest of his life prophesying for God. That's why he went out and did crazy things. And people looked at him and said, what a nut. Here he is buying land that's about to be taken under siege by another army. When people are going to be carried out of their land, Jeremiah is saying, no, God is going to redeem us. We're living in tough times, aren't we? It's like Jesus didn't call the 12, then he's calling us now. Then go out in the world and think, don't think it's going to be fun, don't think it's going to be easy, but I'm going to be with you. I will be with you because I'm with the sparrows. Now, my mother's favorite hymn was Isaiah's on the Sparrow. We sang it at her funeral, or actually... Um, Elaine's beautiful daughter sang it at her funeral. She didn't even know it because it's an old one. But I want us to sing it, and I want us to sing it with all we have in us in a little bit. Because what are we going to sing? Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow. I know he watches me. But the last verse is my favorite. Whenever I'm tempted, amen, whenever clouds arise, when hope gives way to sighing, when songs give way to sighing, when hope within me dies, I draw the closer to him from care. He sets me free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me.
his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I'm going to ask you now to stand and sing that. Let the fire from your heart spread through this congregation and beyond to the glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>